Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another uh, GaudiumSBest22.com Podbean podcast and YouTube video. I am Dr. Larry Chapp and glad to be here. I am super excited today. I have a guest who needs no introduction for probably 99.9% of my uh, followers, and that is the uh, wonderful Mr. George Weigel. And George is the uh, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., uh, George first came to my attention, actually, though, years and years and years ago now, uh, when he wrote the famous his famous uh, biography of Pope John Paul II, Witness to Hope, uh, which is just a fantastic. It's two volumes, right? Witness to Hope and its sequel, The End and the Beginning. The End and the Beginning, which I have to admit, I never read the sequel, uh, but I did read Witness to Hope. And you actually came to my former university, DeSales, uh, and gave a talk shortly after the publication, which is where I first met you many, many years ago. And so anyway, before further ado, welcome to the podcast, George. Thank you, Larry. I now know what you're getting for a Christmas present this year. <laughs> good, good. I would I would I would like that very much. All right. So uh, both George and I, we're, we're going to talk about John Paul later. We're, uh, and I want to plug right up front his latest book uh, to sanctify the world. Here it is. The Vital Legacy of Vatican II. Uh, a, if you're interested in Vatican II, this is an eminently readable uh, and yet thorough uh, book on the Second Vatican Council. And as everybody who watches my podcast knows, I'm a big, big supporter of, of the council. Uh, and so we will be talking about Vatican II as well. But I'm going to start with the uh, Synod on Synodality, because both George and I, uh, within a week or so, are going to be in Rome for the entire month of October, doing our best to cover the Synod on Synodality. Uh, and so I know we both, in various ways, have cast a jaundiced eye towards the Synod. So let's begin there, George. What do you think what do you think, based on your reading of the instrument of Laboris, what took place last year in the initial phase of the Synod and various other things that have gone on since then, what do you think we can expect to see uh, in the upcoming Synod? So is it going to be a lot of hoopla over nothing, or is it going to do something substantive? Whether it does something substantive or not, Larry, I can't possibly predict. But as I cast what I hope is not a jaundiced eye, but a realistic eye uh, <laughs> over, over what's coming in October, by the end of October, it'll be a bloodshot eye, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I, I think the Instrumentum Laboris uh, has buried within the usual language of process and dialogue and all the rest of it, uh, some serious issues. I think there will be a push during this synod for its final report to uh, suggest that national conferences of bishops have doctrinal teaching authority, which is a very bad idea. It's a prescription for yeah. bringing the Catholic Church into the Anglican Communion. Uh, I think there will be a push to have all sorts of councils and committees at every level of church life as an embodiment of this notion of synodality. This will make absolutely no difference here in the United States because we already have these things. Uh, it will make no sense in Sub-Saharan Africa, where, for example, my friend, Father Bill Ryan, runs a wonderful mission in Togo uh, with one parish and 15 missions. Now, is he supposed to have parish councils and finance councils in 15 agricultural villages surrounding his parish? I mean, this is just, this is complete bureaucratic craziness. I don't think there is going to be, based on the instrument of Laboris, uh, the working document, which Father Richard Newhouse, the one synod he attended, Richard was not a great Latinist, but he, he brilliantly just uh, translated instrumentum laborious as the laborious instrument. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the instrumentum laborious for Synod 2024 does not use the LGBTQ language. I think that's right. quite deliberate. There was a lot of pushback against that uh, last year, as you remember. 
Others will certainly press that agenda. Father Jim Martin is already out of the paddock and on the track uh, running with the uh, article recently on, you know, what he learned from the Synod last year and uh, about these issues, which was essentially nothing, and uh, except how awful other people were. Um, and uh, I'm sure he and others will be pressing that. I don't think the question of women as deacons is going to get a lot of attention. It might, but it's been reserved by the Pope to another, to a study committee, even though the Pope has said this is not on. So, I mean, great confusion under heaven yeah. on that room. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, th there is a there is a subtext to this synod as there was to the last one. And that is uh, pre-conclave discussions. We have a pope who will be 19, who will be 88 years old, uh, six weeks after the synod ends. And people are looking to the future. And I'm sure, at least behind the scenes, uh, there will be discussions about what is best for the church going forward. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, dial back uh, to your comment about possibly national Episcopal conferences being given doctrinal authority. How would that work exactly? I mean, those of us of a certain age, you're slightly older than I am, remember the post-conciliar era where there was a slight, slight version of that when these various Episcopal conferences started issuing their own catechisms. You, you remember the Dutch catechism, right, George? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I have a and copy of it somewhere. Yeah, I do, too. Somewhere on these shelves is a beat up old copy of the Dutch Catechism. Uh, and for those who don't know, I mean, the Dutch Catechism was famously liberal catechism that uh, essentially undermined many basic tenets of the faith. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it sort of eventually fizzles. But how how would say that? Let's say the Germans, you say they would have doctrinal authority, doctrinal authority to do what exactly? Yeah, well, this is this is a very serious question. I mean, the idea in itself makes no theological sense. No. Uh, national bishops conferences, the composition of them is determined by national boundaries. National boundaries are completely contingent accidents of history. Uh, if we had not stolen one third of Mexico in 1848, <laughs> bishops of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Southern California would be part of a Mexican bishops' conference. Uh, the borders of Poland were moved 200 kilometers west at the end of the Second World War. Uh, as we are all aware, there are violent conflicts going on all over the world today about, about borders. So to say that those borders constitute an ecclesial reality with a specific gravity, if you will, just makes no theological sense whatsoever. Uh, what this is all about is a way of getting around the fact, or attempting to get around the fact, that there are local churches, Germany comes immediately to mind, as you mentioned, I would say Belgium is another, Switzerland would be a third, where settled matters of Catholic faith have not been received or are in fact denied, and they want some sort of authorization to proceed on their own distinctive path. So, for example, on the question of worthiness to receive Holy Communion, for those in irregular, canonically irregular marriages. The Germans say one thing, the Poles say another thing, and the Germans want their bishop conference to say, to be able to say, that's okay here. Uh, now, this again makes no theological sense, because what is a mortal sin on one side of the Polish-German border cannot be a source of grace 10 miles away. <laughs> on the other side of the board yeah. this is nonsensical but i think you know larry this pardon me for rambling on here but um, oh no go ahead this, i love the ramble this this came up in 2015 um you will remember at the beginning of that synod 
um, a group of 13 cardinals wrote a letter to Pope Francis uh, protesting what they believed was a manipulative process that did not allow the bishops, who were then the only synod members, strictly speaking, uh, to make their judgments known publicly. Uh, that letter caused an enormous amount of controversy. Uh, the Pope agreed to everything these cardinals said, I think very unhappily. But I can tell you that one of the last things that did not make it into the final draft of that letter was a caution that the Synod, in its discussion of uh, Holy Communion for the divorced and irregularly remarried was risking going down the road taken by the Anglican Communion, where what's good in Nigeria uh, may not be good, or to put it better, what's good in in the United in, in England may not be good in Nigeria. And you have these different mm -hmm. churches calling themselves Anglican, but frankly living a different faith. Uh, it was decided at the very end, before the letter was sent to the Pope, to drop that out because the focus was going to be on procedures at the Synod. But the, the cardinals involved in that, uh, and numerous other bishops with whom I was working at the time, were concerned that that was the road down which what we have now come to call synodality was headed. This was the Anglicanization of the Catholic Church. There is going to be fierce resistance to this next month, uh, led in many respects by the bishops of Sub-Saharan Africa, who want nothing to do with this, and who have made their, uh, their judgments rather clear that this is, this is really bad in their, in their situations. Uh, it's bad evangelically, it's bad in their relationship with what can often be aggressive Muslim communities with whom they're trying to find some sort of a modus vivendi. Um, so I think that that's a big one for next month, and we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, I uh, think that, uh, and I really want to focus on this with, with great specificity on this issue of empowering National Episcopal Conferences to do doctrinal things, make pronouncements on moral issues on their own without uh, the necessity of any kind of unanimity or Vatican approval, because it, it, you and I have both said before uh, th that we view this synod as a, as a stalking horse for something else. I really, you know, the average Catholic, if you ask the average Catholic, hey, what do you think of the synod on synodality? They just roll their eyes. They have no idea. I was just home in Nebraska visiting my family, Catholics. I said, uh, I'm going to Rome to cover the Synod. And they're, they're, all of them said, well, what's the Synod? And when I explained to them, they said, oh, OK, well, that's nice, I guess. They don't care. This just has no traction yeah. on the ground, as came out in the Vatican's old polling, which they had to take down off their Web page. So the it, it seems to me that most people know this. Uh, even the Pope at one point acknowledged, I, I, I know that the average Catholics it doesn't seem important. Now, therefore, I do think it's a stalking horse for something else, and that something else is they want to be able to change fundamental moral and doctrinal teachings, but I think specifically moral and, and some sacramental teachings discipline. So that then, uh, Ray, you know, I said in a Catholic World Report article, and here I am rambling a bit now, uh, a while just maybe a few weeks ago, where I said, you know, I don't even think the progressives who are who are involved in the synod believe that much in synodality. I think it's just a buzzword, which is why they can't define it. I said, if the Pope came out tomorrow and said, hey, we're going to ordain women, not just as deacons, but as priests, we're going to green light contraception. We're going to green light divorce and remarriage. We're going to have married priests. We're going to have gay marriage. We're going to have the whole litany of things that the Catholic left wants to see. They would immediately drop the push for synodality. Uh, especially if there was blowback from all of that by local Episcopal conferences uh, from the Africans, for example, to, to quote Walter Casper, they should not tell us so much what to do and so on. So I, I think that I think that this issue is, is really what's driving the Synod or these sets of issues. It's certainly driving what 
some members of the synod are, are bringing to the synod. Uh, whether the Pope himself had this in mind, I don't know. Uh, but let, let's go back just for a moment to this question of national conferences with, with real magisterial teaching authority. Um, because it, 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 I think it sheds some light on, on the synod process as well. Um, first of all, in developed countries with well-established Catholic institutions, the United States, the bishops' conference is run by its staff. It's run by bureaucrats. This is even this has been somewhat improved in recent years. In Germany, it is absolutely true that that the bureaucracy of, of largely lay uh, employees, many of whom are not regular mass attenders, by the way, um, uh, run the bureaucracy of the Catholic Church. How do those people have dogmatic authority? Yeah. Take the other end of the spectrum, little countries like those the Pope has just visited. I mean, how many bishops are in East Timor? I happen to know the Cardinal. He's a fine man. I think there might be two or three others. So that gang has the same teaching authority as the 300 Catholic bishops of the United States or the 77 bishops in Germany or the how many million bishops there are in Italy these days. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah. this just is, it, it's just silly. Um, now, uh, you get to a point that I tried to point out at the end of the last century and I think it's going to be a real problem this time. And that is that this whole process is completely manipulated. Uh, here's a good example. There was a lot of blowback last time, last October, because as you remember, I think there was one parish priest yeah. among 400 and some synod members. So what do they do? They create a meeting of world priests summoned on like three weeks notice to come to Rome and let, let's hear your voices. Well, I've seen the report on that meeting from an American priest who said we were talked to the entire time. Yeah. We were talked at the entire time. This model of so-called conversations in the spirit is a manipulative way of running discussions in which the facilitator or whatever this person is called controls the discussion. There is no real engagement of differences. And I know that at the last meeting of the Synod Council, the group of bishops elected by their brother bishops to consult with the Synod General Secretariat, there was overwhelming support for a different discussion method than this conversations in the spirit business. What are we going to do in October? We're going to do conversations in the spirit. <laughs> At that same Synod General Council meeting, there was overwhelming support for having two days off a week rather than working half of Sabbath. What are we going to do in October? They will work half of Saturday. There is no responsiveness on the part of this Synod General Secretary yeah. to the concerns of the people who are, who are supposed to be its counselors. Um, so I'm hoping there will be some pushback about process uh, in the early going, that people will feel less constrained to say, wait a minute, yeah, the things that need discussing can't be discussed in four minute sound bites. Yeah, it it and you know that might seem like a trivial point, but it but it isn't. Uh, the fact that here we are supposedly having this conversation and the synod members are, you know, we're listening to the Holy Spirit speak, and yet they have no say even over the simplest of procedural things. You know, I remember I was speaking. With, I spoke with three members of the Synod last October. And the one thing that all three of them said to me over dinner was, 
and I won't say who it was, but obviously uh, what they said to me over dinner was the whole process is just exhausting because you're there from early morning to late afternoon, you know, five and a half days, you know, a, a week. And there's just only so much sitting in a chair and discussing these things that, that a human being can do. It's almost something it's like a psyop operation to try and break people down so that they're more pliant or something or other. Yeah, well, I, you know, no one's ever figured out a way to make synods work. I remember a great wisecrack by Cardinal Edward Egan of New York. I think this was during the 2001 synod when after a week of synoding, he was at dinner at the Villa Stritch, the uh, house where Americans working, American priests working in the Curia live. And somebody said, your eminence, has everything been said? after a week and Cardinal League had said, yes, everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there, there was a problem of, of verbosity and repetition and whatnot. Uh, but this process is, is, is to err completely in the other direction. I remember last year, my friend, uh, Major Archbishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk of Ukraine, the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, a genuine hero of the faith these days, uh, said to me and a group of bishops with whom he was meeting, this is absurd. I am trying to hold together a church in the middle of a war where we are running into fallout shelters Every couple of hours, our priests are being murdered, our people are being killed left and right, and I'm supposed to describe all of this in four minutes? Yeah. Some facilitator shuts me down if I go over four minutes? He said, this is, it's not only absurd, it's insulting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You can no more imagine Athanasius <laughs> participating in a conversation in the spirit that Nicaea, and you can imagine him flying to the moon. I mean, it's completely crazy. Yeah, uh, it is. Uh, so I don't know whether there'll be any pushback against this. Uh, we will We will see. I think what is going to be different, Larry, about this exercise in October is that it is supposed to produce a final report. Now, how that final report will be confected, we don't know because there has been no release yet. I mean, here we are talking on September 23rd. This thing starts in, in eight days and there's no clarity on whether, for example, there will be votes on propositions that the final report will be divided into propositions and there will be votes on them, which was the way synods in the past uh, had, had manifested their will, met, made their judgments. Known. If there are going to be votes, who's doing the voting? Yeah. Everybody? The bishops? Yeah. If, if everybody is voting, are the bishops' votes going to be disaggregated from that? Yeah. So that we can see that whether the people who actually have, by by reason of ordination, teaching authority in the church, have a different view than this other cast of thousands that's uh, being uh, constructed. I mean, this is this could be a real flashpoint. I think so. Well, you yeah. know, we'll see what we'll happens. see. Well, before we move on to other things, one last question here. On, on the synod, which is, uh, I'll just put, put it to you. Uh, I, I, I'll just say my own view and then see if you think I'm all wet, which I could very well be. My point would be that in theory, a, a, a more synodal church and a, a church less centralized in curial Roman authority is, is probably a good thing. And I just said in a podcast the other day to somebody, I, I wouldn't necessarily have a, a strong objection to Rome allowing national Episcopal conferences, despite their theological questionable status, allowing them to pick their own bishops with the Vatican having simply a kind of veto power 
uh, rather than all bishops being the, rather than the conference is sending the Vatican a list of people and the Vatican just chooses whoever they want anyway, uh, that that would be maybe a good thing in the spirit of collegiality and so on. What what do you think of uh, do we do do does the Vatican need decentralization? Do we have a bloated papacy or is this a mythology that needs to be diffused? Well, I think uh, everyone who has considered these matters carefully as opposed to just polemically uh, knows that the Catholic Church, at least the Western Catholic Church, uh, has become far too popocentric and far too Rome, Roman centered, yeah. really since the mid 19th century. Now, that was essential then, as the papacy, as Russ Hittinger has pointed out numerous times, became the last line of defense for national hierarchies, which were under intense pressure from modernizing states to become you know, what the Emperor Joseph II of Austria-Hungary said, the church is a department of the police. You know, <laughs> we, we run the church. No, no, you needed a universal authority that would protect local churches from overweening state power, which is why, by the way, perhaps the, the more important thing that Vatican I did was to define the universal jurisdiction of the Pope that the Pope yeah. has a role in local churches. That is arguably as important or even more important than the very narrow definition of when the Pope can teach and fell. Now, the question is, how is that papal role in local churches to be exercised? Right. In some cases, it remains very important that the Pope be a voice for the voiceless, it in local situations. Uh, in other situations, local church is perfectly capable of taking care of business, most business, on its own, with reference to the See of Peter when things really get controversial and divided and conflicted and so forth. So I think uh, over the, the rest of this 21st century, we're going to have to achieve some sort of greater balance between the fact that the See of Peter is the center of the church of Jesus and these local churches, many of them can, in, in many respects, look after their own business. I think there are real problems that need addressing in the church that are not being addressed by this synod because they're being warped by it. There are, for example, there are certainly venues in the Catholic Church where women are second-class citizens, where they are not being allowed to exercise their baptismal gifts and respond and meet their baptismal responsibilities. And, and those local churches need to be helped to move in a better direction. But that problem is being used as the stalking horse behind which to press what has already been declared to be an impossibility, namely admitting women to holy orders. There is a problem of clericalism in the church. There yeah. are certain cultural circumstances in which clergy are little authoritarians. And that needs to be addressed. But you're not going to address it by surrounding clergy with ever thicker layers of bureaucracy. Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of what I find so frustrating about this, is that John Paul II and Benedict XVI gave us, in their authoritative interpretation of that, the theological and philosophical materials to address these questions. But instead of addressing them, we're wasting time on other things that are in fact already settled. Ingo, uh, I think that is so true. Not to keep plugging my own articles, but that same Catholic World Report article that came out a couple of weeks ago now or a week ago, 
where I, I think it was, I think Carl Olson gave it the title Rome, Rome Synodals While the World Burns, you know, and, and I essentially was making the point that, I mean, that the synod seems an exercise in pastoral tone deafness, where you've got all these crises, both in the church and in the world, uh, and so real problems, some of which you just identified, that this, a, a real synod on synodality could be addressing. Instead, we're focusing all of our attention on these, these inside baseball questions about bureaucratic structure and this, that, and the other thing. And it well, just... In, in addition, Larry, let me, let me say this, and it's going to sound harsh, but, but you know sometimes the truth is harsh. The promotion of this process under the notion or under the rubric that there are voices in the church that haven't been heard. Yeah. For example, on, you know, women and holy orders, on divorced and remarried, holy communion, et cetera, et cetera. This is a lie. These voices have been heard endlessly for 40 years. Th those voices have not been agreed with by the teaching authority of the church or by most of them. Yeah, church. yeah. Um, so the notion that we're giving voice to the voiceless, no, these people haven't shut up for four decades. <laughs> Longer. And and and, um, uh, and and that caterwauling just becomes an obstacle to the proclamation of the gospel and to fixing the problems that are real and could be fixed if we would stop wasting time pretending yeah, absolutely. that Catholicism is infinitely fungible. You know, we can change yeah. just about anything if we put our minds to it. I, I so share that, that sentiment, that these voices have been heard. I think, for the most part, th those Catholics out there, which is the vast majority of them, who have not been involved in the Catholic Academy, especially in the theological disciplines, perhaps those Catholics average can be excused for not understanding for, for the past 60 years in Europe and North America and beyond, the Catholic Theological Guild has been dominated then and now by the progressive liberal wing of the church. Uh, you know, just ask any more sort of conservative orthodox young theologian trying to get tenure at a major Jesuit university. And uh, you hear, you heard, you've heard it. I've heard it where they have to fly under the radar and hide their true colors. Otherwise they would be persecuted right out of their tenure track job. You know, so the idea that these voices have not been heard is patently absurd. They've not only been heard, they've dominated the conversation. And the fact is they just haven't gotten the answer, as you just pointed out, that they wanted. So now they're they think they have a pope that actually is going to give them the answer that they want, although I don't think he will. Yeah, there's another dimension of this that I described in my book during the 2002 abuse crisis as the Charles Davis syndrome. Um, people who are not our age will not remember Charles Davis. Charles Davis was kind of the Dick McBrien of, or Andy Greeley of English Catholicism in the years immediately after the council. He was an able man, quite mediagenic, everybody's favorite liberal, and was you know, pretty much pushing particularly the contraceptive agenda. Yeah. Well, um, Humane Vitae comes out, Charles Davis leaves the Catholic Church, becomes an Anglican priest, and no one pays him the slightest bit of attention anymore. Right. Catholic priest attacks Catholic Church is man bites dog, and that is news. Anglican priest attacks Catholic Church is no news. Yeah. Two generations of Catholic dissidents have learned from this. You have to stay formally within the boundaries in order for people to pay attention to. Yeah, that's and, absolutely and, true. And uh, uh, I mean, I, this is a terrible shame because it's a great waste of evangelical time and, and energy. 
Yeah, you see this, too, with regard to a lot of the women out there in the women priest movement, too, you know, who want women to be ordained. And you, 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 sometimes someone will ask them, well, why don't you just go and become an Episcopalian uh, priest or something along those lines? Because when they articulate what their ecclesiology is, you begin to understand they don't really believe in apost- you know, the, the, the authority of the Catholic Church, great, and they don't believe in apostolic succession. And so you realize there are no theological barriers to them becoming Episcopalian. So why do they stay? And I think you've just nailed the reason, because if they stay, then they're, then they're important. If they leave, they're just another Episcopalian priest out in Dog Breath, Virginia, running a small parish somewhere. I, there's another dimension of this that's, that's quite disheartening. Um, the notion that flying a desk in a diocesan bureaucracy or in the Roman Curie for that matter, and being able to tell other people what to do is yeah. more important than raising children, than being a nursing sister in a part of the world that doesn't know what a thermometer is or a stethoscope educating future generations this is yeah. really frankly kind of sick uh it's a sick notion of empowerment um and i mean exact i thoroughly mean what i said about there are parts of the world church where the evangelical capabilities of women are not recognized but when I hear people talking about the empowerment of women in the church, and then when you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, flying a desk in a church bureaucracy. I mean, this is just a really weird notion of, frankly, the apostolate. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, but- and it needs to be called out for that. Most certainly does. Well, let, let's move on, uh, unless you have some further thoughts on the synod you want to share. I, 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 as, as long as I have you here, I don't want to miss the opportunity to sort of pick your brain about John Paul II. And the reason is, once again, you know, the papacy of John Paul now recedes ever further into the past. And so there are a lot of young Catholics out there, especially ones drawn to, say, traditionalism, who if they even remember John Paul, they simply remember the feeble Parkinson's John Paul of like the last six years of his papacy or whatever. They don't understand, it seems to me, the greatness of the man. Why I was a seminarian first year, 78, when he became Pope. They don't understand what an inspiration he was to millions and millions and millions of Catholics around the world, why he was so important. And so a new narrative has arisen among young traditionalist Catholics that John Paul II was a modernist. You see this in their in their social media, but he was a modernist. He kissed the Koran. He had that Assisi thing. Uh, he didn't run the church properly. And so he's a failed pope, should never have been canonized. Yeah, you, you know the narrative, right? You know the narrative. So I would like you right now to, in a sense, give us an apologia for why John Paul II really is John Paul the Great. Well, uh, I'll begin with the day after he died. I was in New York working with NBC uh, when the Pope died. Uh, We got the plane to Rome that night, Uh, changed planes at Heathrow. I scooped up as many magazines and newspapers as I could, Uh, got to Rome. And the next day, uh, I ran into Billy Graham's daughter, her daughter-in-law, I guess she was, uh, coming down from our platform uh, overlooking the Vatican. And I had just read in all this stuff I had scooped up at, at Heathrow that Billy Graham had said that John Paul II was the greatest Christian witness in the 20th century. Wow. And I said to this lady, I said, please uh, uh, thank your father-in-law for that very generous comment. 
all the more generous because he, your father-in-law, is the, is the only other possible candidate for that title. <laughs> you know, in yeah, terms of yeah. number of people actually affected. Yeah, uh, I am afraid to say that these young people are are historical ignoramuses. Yeah, they don't know. They have a completely cartoonish view of the history of the church uh, prior to the Second Vatican Council the years immediately before the council, the decades immediately before the council, the whole first third of my Vatican II book is dedicated to why the council was necessary, right. which is another way of saying why John Paul II was necessary, because without Vatican II, there is no Polish Pope. Um, uh, his ability to touch lives in every conceivable cultural circumstance around the world was really unprecedented. Um, and he touched them not with feel-good stuff, but with Jesus the Lord, yeah. with the basic kerygma of Christian faith. I mean, his in uh, the day, uh, the Good Friday, his last Good Friday. You remember that poignant scene? He couldn't do the uh, Via Crucis, the Way of the Cross at the Colosseum, but he right. watched it on a TV set, and he was holding the cross. He was holding the cross, and he was back shot. You didn't see the front. Of right. I did five hours of the Today program on Holy Saturday, and five different times as. You know, as you roll across the time zones, Katie Couric asked me, why were they, why was he back shot? Is it because he looks so terrible? And five different times, I said, no, this is the summation of his entire life, which has never been to say, look at me. It has been to say, look at Jesus Christ. And if you yes. can, if you can see the Lord Jesus through me, then my life has met its vocational obligations. So if people who don't understand that do not understand that 95% of the priests ordained in the last 40 years, 30 certainly, are priests because of John Paul, that the American Episcopate is in pretty good shape today because these are John Paul II bishops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's a shame because uh, the, the historical ignorance and this kind of false nostalgia uh, is blinding people to the great Christian witness of our time. Uh, I remember when Witness to Hope first came out in 99, saying in some interview, this is the most consequential pope in 500 years. And a very senior ch churchman, American, said to me, what are you talking about, 500 years? It's, it's the entire millennium. <laughs> it's the yeah. It's the second would, millennium. Yeah, now, I, you know, I you would say have, I would say fifteen hundred years. Well, it you could have. I mean, you know, one has to conjure with Innocent the Third and Pius the Fifth. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of very important people. But um, I, I think the thing that that you you talk about, you know, people not realizing how we were sort of on our beam ends in nineteen seventy eight. No one expected. If, if you would have said in 1978 that the next pope was going to be the central figure, or at least a pivotal figure, in the collapse of European communism, that he would revitalize the church, that he would be the greatest vocation director in history, that he would draw the largest crowds in human history, be seen live by more people than any man in human history, you would have been taken away to a place with a nice <laughs> padded cell yeah. and, you know, be given some, uh, you know, uh, oatmeal to copy your dad. Well, yeah. I mean, he was on nobody's <laughs> radar. I remember 
Yeah, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I remember I was yeah. a young seminarian and we were all crowded around this single TV in the rector's office because we didn't have TVs in our rooms in the rector's office because the white smoke and all this are way. And, and, and then it, it's announced, you know, that, you know, we have a blah, 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 and it's Cardinalum Voitiwa. And a bunch of us immediately started shouting, oh, it's an African. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, we didn't, yeah. we, we the Voitiwa is. It, we thought oh, we had no idea who he was, uh, it's and yet, not just that he was unexpected, Larry. It's that the impact oh, was unexpected. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Nobody believed the church had this in it anymore. You know. Yeah, Nobody you mentioned the, the church. You mentioned it. the the communism thing, and I also say to young people, I said, uh, unless you're of a certain age. You do not have an experience of how the Cold War dominated the, the geopolitical economic landscape of the entire world for from 1945 on uh, up until like 1990 dominated it. It was everything. And so for the church to make this bold move to elect as pope, a cardinal from behind the Iron Curtain, and not just from any nation behind the, the the biggest pain in the in the Kremlin's ass of any nation behind the Vatican curtain, Poland. This was earth shaking at that time and proved to be so. Yeah, I mean, in in retrospect, um, it made sense within the context of that electorate. I mean, you may not have heard of him. I barely knew he existed. Everybody knew about Cardinal Vyshinsky, but who's this other guy? Yeah. Cardinal. Um, but at the time of his election, Carol Wojtyla was one of the best known churchmen in the world. He had been at all four sessions of the council, uh, where he played a leading role in a number of questions, including, I believe, writing Gaudium et Spes 22. Yes, um, absolutely. Not, not to mention Gaudium et Spes 24. Yes. So that, you know, we, these are the two most quoted passages from the documents of Vatican II. Absolutely. Uh, in his magisterium. And I, I you know, I, it, it always amuses me to think he was just saying, look, people, here I am telling you this again, as I keep saying to you, Jesus yeah. Christ reveals both the truth about us and the truth about the Father. Self-gift is the road to him flourishing. And that's him. But he had been at every synod. He had been active in a number of Roman congregations. He had done two world junkets, tours, largely to Polish communities around the world. But I mean, he knew uh, other people. Knew him. Is that why he went to Philadelphia in, I think, 76? Was, it was part of a, his one of his trips to the United States, to the Eucharistic Congress. Yeah, which among other things gave us that hideous hymn, "Gift of Finest Wheat." <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard it in Poland this summer when I was teaching yeah. in Krakow, and I sent a note to our parish music director saying it's just as bad in Polish as it is in English. <laughs> <laughs> in any yeah. event. Um, no, At least... it's a real shame that, you know, people don't take the trouble to meet this guy. Now, here's a way to do it. This is next month, October 20th, is the 30th anniversary of the publication of his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. Read it. It's a personal reflection on the great questions of the human condition, many of the great questions of the day. And it's a window into the mind and soul of a truly radically converted Christian disciple whose whole life was about sharing that discipleship with others. No, oh, absolutely. It is a great book. I think I have three copies of it in various places here. I've given it away to people. And as you know, as you said to me before we went on, you know, it's it was it also represented an entirely new way for a pope to teach something. Yeah. And what he what he was doing, I think, was reflecting on these great questions as a man of faith, a man of considerable intellect. But he wasn't playing the oracle. 
You know, here right, I am, right. I'm the Pope, therefore I am an oracle, and I have worthy opinions on everything because I am an oracle. Yeah. That is not what the office of Peter is about. Oh, yeah, exactly. And he, and he showed that. Well, beyond the fact, all the things that we've talked about so far, there is also the fact that he left behind probably the largest body of magisterial papal teaching, probably from a, po a single pope in the history of the entire church, uh, an intellectual legacy uh, that, you know, great dear friends of both of us, like David L. Schindler, uh, spent his entire life trying to unpack and, and others as well. And yet, and yet it seems to, I mean, obviously we're just beginning to scratch the surface of its depth and profundity. And he also left us with this magisterial uh, interpretation of Vatican II, as then did Benedict. But it seems to me, and this kind of brings us back to the Synod, that there is an effort afoot amongst many to completely eclipse his papacy, to treat it as if, as in terms of the teaching aspect of his papacy, as if it was just this momentary blip on the radar that we've now happily left behind us. We had the council, and then we had this unfortunate reactionary as Pope for 25 years, but now we're finally emerging into the light of day, and we can implement Vatican II. Like Amoris Laetitia, it's, you know, not a single representative from the JP2 Institute in Rome was invited to, to discuss that. Uh, it's on the family, for crying out loud. Uh, and, and where is Veritati's splendor ever quoted by, by this pope or any of his, of his, I'm going to be nice, <laughs> of his followers, let's put it that way. Uh, this is definitely one of the light motifs of the last 11 years. I think it's quite deliberate on the part of some, whether it's quite deliberate on the part of Pope Francis, I don't know. Um, uh, the principal point of attack uh, is, as you say, Veritatis Splendor, the encyclical on the reform of Catholic moral theology. And as I've written to on blue in the face, um, this is the revenge of the theological guild for the smackdown it received in Veritas, yeah. Center, which, among other things, insisted that there are what we call intrinsically evil acts, some things that are just off the board, period. The guild has denied that for 50 years. Normal people understand. It. I mean, when you say to normal people, you know, there are there are intellectuals who believe that that, some, that that nothing is intrinsically evil. They just look at you and say, "What's the matter yeah. with these guys?" It's Orwell all over again. Some things are so idiotic that only intellectuals can believe them. I remember when Veritatis Splendor came out. I was on. I did an NPR show with a frankly deranged lady theologian who insisted, first of all, that Einstein's theory of relativity meant that there were no intrinsically evil acts. <laughs> my, my head is exploding. Yeah. And then she, then she challenged me to name one. And I said, what combination of intentions and consequences would justify your being raped in the parking lot outside this studio an hour from now. That was the end of that discussion. That's right. It's not hard I mean, to think of some. It's not, no. I mean, torturing children. I mean, you can go through the whole list. Genocide, torturing Genocide, kids, right? rape. I mean, yeah. I, I would almost say the designated hitter rule, but that's, that's to in baseball, but that's, <laughs> that's the DH is an yeah. intrinsically evil action. Um, uh, but no, I, I uh, Larry, what I would say is that it's the dying parts of the world church that are trying to deconstruct John Paul II. Yeah, if you look at the living parts of the world church, whether we're talking about here in the United States or what seeds of life or sprouting up in, in Western Europe. You certainly look at the church in Africa. 
these are the people who are still inspired by JP2's magisterium, by his interpretation of that of Vatican II, by the council rightly understood. So, um, you know, the fact that you got a lot of graybeards in the Western world having one last uh, slug out of the old descent bottle yeah. um, is unfortunate and it's a waste of time. But th th that's a dying gang. I mean, it really is. Yeah, yeah it really uh, is. I dying. mean, as you know, as well as I do, the real theological juice in the United States today is with things like the Sacra Doctrina group, with uh, uh, the, uh, what's the other, the Academy of Catholic Theology. Yeah. Uh, journal like Nova et Vetera, Bishop Barron's just started a new theological journal. I mean, nobody, who in their right mind reads theological studies? Nobody, nobody, or I mean, or, or America Mag. I mean, uh, I would also throw in there uh, the theology department at Notre Dame, uh, which even if Notre Dame has gone the way of all flesh as a whole, uh, the theology department there is world class and orthodox. I know people there like Jennifer Martin, Cyril O'Regan, uh, John Betts, and, and people like that. It's yeah, Gary that's Anderson, what... John Cavadini. No, it's yeah. a very oh yeah, well, again, yeah. and that's true at other places around. Uh, well, and I have friends, I, I you know, down at the JP two Institute of Washington D.C. David C. Schindler, Mike Hanby, uh, not people that you would necessarily agree with their politics, I fear, uh, but they're, nevertheless. They're my favorite integralists. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah. Other. Well, I have to tell you, I, you know, I, I have a lot of dear friends who, who say to me, you know, when, I, when they find out that you and I have sort of become friends, they say, how can you become friends with this neocon monster from the first thing? You know, it's like, well, you know, because he's not a monster and the neocons, though, I don't completely agree with uh, the economics and politics of Richard Newhouse and first things and so on. Nevertheless, there's a lot of juice there. And and uh, you and I see eye to eye probably at about 95 percent of the issues that are David, out there. David Schindler, the elder, and I used to meet every year at the reception the nuncio throws on the anniversary of the pope's election and we would have a few drinks together making good use of our peter's pence contribution <laughs> at the vatican embassy and then we'd say to each other at the end well we at least vote the same one <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great that's that's a good anecdote that's that's a good story because we, yeah. we we both uh uh, but I want to come back to the before we have we've been uh, I don't know much time yet, but maybe we could go on for another five, 10 minutes. But uh, I want to come back to very top the splendor uh, and, uh, to in other words, one of the p things that people write to me with regard to my podcast, because I do like to interview, uh, in, you know, heavyweight theologians and, and pundits and so forth, is that they learn they learn things from here because a lot of the young listeners and stuff they lack context and they like the context that this brings. So the context that I want to bring up, you mentioned it, that there was this vast swath of Catholic moral theologians that were denying the reality of intrinsically evil actions. And, and that was, they were part of a moral theological movement, as you well know, called proportionalism or consequentialism. And in many ways, I, I studied under Germain Grise. I know you knew Germain as well. He often said to me, oh, that's just a conclusion in search of an argument. That's what that is. And the conclusion that they wanted is contraception is OK. And uh, certain sexual actions we used to think were immoral are really OK because of all the mitigating circumstances. But, you know, they're, they're, in the effort to, in a sense, undermine the sexual morality of the church, they end up saying, well, there's no such thing as intrinsically evil actions, which then, of course, is absurd. And then you have theologians like Grise and, and others that came forward to, to combat that. And this then became the sort of foundation for John Paul II's very Tati Splendor, which, as you pointed out, was uh, routinely chastised by the theological guild. Um, so what do, do you think... That now, and this is my question. Do you think there's been a resurgence under the current papacy of this proportionalist, consequentialist moral theology? Yeah, without, without a doubt. I mean, it now dominates the moral theology department at the Gregorian University in Rome. Uh, 
these people are, you know, they, they've seen their chances and they took them. Um, what is different this time, Larry, is that in the old days, the days of Bernard Herring and Joseph Fuchs, proportionalism or consequentialism, as you say, was intended to provide a justification for an alteration of the church's view on what are the appropriate means of regulating fertility. When, when Paul VI figured out that that was the game, yeah. this was not a pastoral concern, there was a theological revolution that could undermine the entire structure of Catholic moral theology. He wrote Humanae Vitae the way he did. And those guys went nuts and they have stayed unhappy <laughs> ever, yeah. ever since. The problem is that today the, the focus has shifted and it shifted to the LGBT, et cetera, agenda. That's what's yeah. driving the resurrection, if you will, of proportionless moral theology. And that is, in my view, a far graver matter. Contraception is a question of marital chastity. That's important. The LGBTQ agenda is a violation, is a frontal assault on biblical anthropology. Yes, which exactly. Which is the frontal assault on divine Um. And that's why this new proportionalist drive has to be combated. Because if you peel that onion back far enough, you you get to the denial of Genesis 3, yeah, or Genesis yeah. 1 to 3. And then where are we? We are in never, never so the, the stakes are much higher this time. I think what John Paul II did, beginning in his time as Archbishop of Krakow, but continuing through Veritatis Splendor, um, which I have always said is a phenomenological sandwich with a Thomistic meat inside. The first and <laughs> yeah. third parts of Veritatis Splendor yeah are very pastorally oriented. Uh, and the second part is, you know, here's how we know that there are such things as intrinsic yeah. and why that's important and so forth and so on. Um, John Paul II knew that the old way of arguing, of presenting the church's sexual ethic simply could not be heard in yeah. modern cultural circumstances. So that's why we get the theology of the body, which we haven't right. mentioned so far, but it's very important. And that's why we get the revival in, in Veritatis Splendor of, in a modern form, in a contemporary form, I think deeply in, influenced by Father Servet Pinkers, the revival of Aristotelian to mystic virtue ethics as, as the framework or the basic narrative within which Catholic moral theology operates, which means, as Pinkers argues in Sources of Christian Ethics, the fundamental, the Magna Carta of Catholic moral theology is the Beatitudes. We start with the Beatitudes and the rules are guide guardrails that help us move towards bingo living that yeah blessed which is to say happy life that's a different way of presenting things than the way that paul the sixth adopted in 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 humanity vitae yeah. and uh i think again the living parts of the world church are those that have adopted this this approach Absolutely. I remember uh, when I studied under Germain Grise, he was writing the first volume of his moral theology. It was called The Way of the Lord Jesus. And uh, Grise, too, made the Beatitudes the central jumping off point 
of that of that entire first first volume. He developed out of each beatitude what he called modes of responsibility and so forth, which I won't go into here. Uh, but yeah, and Pinkers does a brilliant job of, on, in dealing with the Sermon on the Mount and the beatitudes. And so I recommend to people read Survey Pinkers as well. And anyway, uh, we've been at this now for probably about an hour and ten minutes. We should probably think about wrapping this up. Do you have any? Are there any issues and topics that I have not brought up that you would like to cover? Well, we'd be here from now till doomsday yes. <laughs> if that were the case. But no, yeah. I, I just want to thank you for having me on here for all your great work, and I look forward to working together with you in Rome. Yes, and I look forward to that as well, So, which will be in about a, a week or less than a week. Anyway, thank you, George, for coming on the show. And thank you all for listening. Uh, bye now.